Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. We're here for the third installment of our Nuclear Proliferation in the 2020s event series. This event is Yvonne, the JCPOA, and Holding Back a Breakout. I'm delighted to be joined by Sahil Shah, who is a policy fellow at the European Leadership Network and is also a policy advisor at the Institute for Security and Technology, as well as Ali Vaez, who is the project director for Iran at the International Crisis Group. My name is Leah Walker. I'm a senior defense associate at the Institute for Security and Technology, where Bay Area Defense and Technology Research Institute uh, focused on developing solutions for emerging security and technology threats. It's wonderful to have you all here. Thank you for spending your morning or afternoon or evening with us. We're looking forward to the conversation. Sahil and Ali, thank you so much for joining me. Great to be Thanks with you. Yeah. Wonderful. Well, I'm thrilled to have the two of you here. We're going to be talking, of course, about Iran. It has been really quite interesting because the first two events we did were on North Korea. North Korea, about two weeks before they tested their last missile, so it wasn't quite in the news then. And uh, previously it was with Vip and Nering about this proliferation book. So I'm thrilled to have an event where we can talk about what's going on at the moment. Um, this is very pertinent, and I think it's been interesting to see this evolve under the sort of cloud of this Russian invasion of Ukraine we've been living under for over a month. So I wanted to start by giving the two of you a chance to speak and maybe just share with us what you've been watching really closely this week and um, what you're thinking about the process at the moment. Sahil, I'll start with you. Um, yeah, absolutely. Thanks so much for having um, Ali and I. It's a, it's a great um, platform to talk about these issues. And of course, as IST focuses on the intersection of technology and security, um, you know, the JCPOA is also resembles that intersection because it's a highly technical security agreement and one that really was unprecedented in terms of the scope of verification and monitoring on the ground in Iran. And um, it's, we were reaching a year now since the negotiations have resumed. Um, to try to get it back on track, but of course it still hangs in limbo. Um, formally, the eighth round of those negotiations went on a pause, um, in part because of the remaining issues between the US and Iran, but also in part because of obstacles that were spawned by Russia's invasion of Ukraine and subsequent US sanctions on Russia, which raised questions over you know, whether or not Russia would be able to fulfill its commitments under the deal, A, as a party that um, helps fulfill a lot of the civil nuclear cooperation under the deal, but also perhaps wider um, demands than that. So that's what we've been kind of looking at at the ELN over the past week or two. Um, but I will keep it at that and turn to Ali because he's had far more exciting week than I have um, and has been in the center of the action. So. Thank you very much. It's great to be with you. Uh, thank you for the invitation and great to be on with Sahil. Um, I'm not sure if I would uh, qualify my week as uh, exciting, given the fact that uh, the negotiations are uh, unfortunately in deadlock. Um, uh, as you know, um, uh, the latest uh, or the last obstacle to reaching a deal to restore the 2015 nuclear deal uh, is this question of uh, designation of Iran's Revolutionary Guards, uh, IRGC, as an FTO uh, organization. Um, and unfortunately, it's a zero-sum issue. In many ways, it's uh, really not a bridgeable uh, divide because you either have uh, FTO designation on IRGC on or off. There's not like half FTO designation where both sides can meet in the middle ground. Now, I'll get to that in a second, but, uh, you know, just to say uh, it will soon be a year uh, since uh, the negotiations aimed at restoring the JCPOA started. And, you know, I think once the story of these uh, discussions is written, it will be a tale of three delays. Uh, first, the Biden administration delayed, uh, and the reason was they hesitated to um, uh, embark on a foreign policy issue that they knew would be controversial and could potentially uh, 
uh, stymie the president's domestic agenda. Um, and uh, they also, uh, I think, committed a mistake uh, in underestimating how much uh, mistrust uh, was created or trust had been uh, completely eroded as a result of the, of the Trump administration's withdrawal from the JCPOA in 2018. Uh, and that led the Iranians to uh, basically toughen their own stance uh, and uh, come up with uh, a lot of demands that were completely unrealistic within the framework of the deal. Uh, then there was a presidential transition in Iran, and that resulted in a five-month uh, long hiatus uh, that uh, really made uh, reaching an agreement that much more difficult because the Iranian nuclear program was advancing at a speed of light in this period. Uh, and then finally, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, with the start of the Ukraine crisis, we had the Russians uh, creating a hindrance uh, that was uh, thankfully short-lived uh, but it basically killed the momentum that existed in Vienna, uh, and both sides were really close to finishing uh, the negotiations, um, with the exception of the FTO issue that I, I mentioned, but the fact that they had to take a pause so that this Russian demand for being exempt from uh, Western sanctions uh, over its aggression in Ukraine uh, and its trade with Iran uh, could be resolved. The Iranians managed to convince the Russians to walk that back in uh, a week later, but momentum was already lost. And now uh, we are in a situation that, uh, again, um, it's difficult to go back to Vienna and resume talks unless there is a uh, solution to this uh, FTO issue. Um, let me leave it at, at that. And again, I'm happy to uh, dig deeper on FTO or any other aspect that is of interest to you. Thank you. Yeah, I'd love to, let's focus a little bit more on the FTO first, and then we can get more into the Ukraine crisis. Uh, Sahil, have you been watching this as well? What are your thoughts on what Ali just said? Yeah, um, you know, from different negotiators, been hearing throughout the months um, that the FTO designation on the IRGC was something that the Iranians wanted on the table. Um, my understanding is that the U.S., is obviously very hesitant to um, you know, give that away for free. Um, although it's a largely symbolic designation and of course is part of the large effort by the Trump administration to make it very difficult for a future administration, which is of course the Biden administration now to return to the deal. Um, the political costs of removing that designation are going to be high on the Biden administration. So um, they really would like something in return. And from reporting, we know that at first, um, you know, there was hope that from the U.S. side that they could get Iran to the table and sit down with them to talk about certain sanctions issues and also the FTO designation. But since that isn't seemingly possible for the Iranians. Again, on their side, they feel that that would be too politically costly to their domestic audiences and power centers. Um, it's at a deadlock. And Enrique Mora um, from the EU has traveled to Tehran over the weekend and is now in Washington and is doing the classic European shuttle diplomacy back and forth to try to see what can be done. Um, in recent days, there's been an onslaught of criticism on the Biden administration for even entertaining this, but it's really great that the expert community has stepped in to explain why the FTO designation is largely symbolic and that the material consequences of lifting such a designation um, are really minimal in reality. Um, the IRGC will remain extremely sanctioned. It'll still remain designated under multiple different you know, angles so um, yeah, I'll leave it at that. But um, Ali, I know, has great thoughts on, on the FTO designation and how it fits into this larger, very, very complex negotiation. Yes, and I would love to hear those thoughts, Ali, as well as do we have a sense of what the Iranians would like in return for, would what the Americans would like the Iranians to give in return for revoking that status? Sure. So Saho framed it well, you know, it's, uh, it, it, but, but the reality is that this is really a, uh, an absurd issue for both sides uh, in the sense that, um, you know, for the Iranians, their argument is that if uh, IRGC remains uh, designated as an FTO, 
it would deter international firms from engaging the Iranian market. But as Sahel said, the IRGC is the most sanctioned entity in the world. So one sanction on or off really does not uh, make any difference. Uh, and the IRGC would remain radioactive for international firms anyways. Uh, U.S. argument is uh, that um, uh, removing the IRGC is very difficult at a time that uh, the Iranians are actively plotting to take revenge for General Soleimani's assassination uh, in 2020. Uh, uh, and obviously, they're targeting former uh, uh, U.S. officials, Trump administration officials. Uh, plus, there is a lot of pressure by uh, Iranian-backed uh, militias in the region. Uh, on U.S. allies, uh, be it in Saudi Arabia or uh, Israel, but also against U.S. presence in places like Iraq. Uh, and under those circumstances, it's very difficult to lift uh, the FDO designation. But again, the reality is that if the FDO designation had worked, uh, then there was no threat against uh, U.S. presence or uh, U.S. individuals, right? So this is, in fact, very evidence that uh, the designation has not achieved uh, its objective and has not made the U.S. any safer. So holding on to a sanction that has utterly failed makes zero sense. Um, but, uh, but again, the reality is that this is not about practical issues, it's really political. Um, and uh, for the Iranians, it's hard to sell a deal uh, back home when one of the key uh, stakeholders in Iran's political system uh, remains blacklisted. It's basically an admission by uh, Iranian negotiators uh, that, uh, uh, you know, they, they also agree or do recognize uh, that the IRGC uh, is an FDO, uh, um, uh, which obviously is impossible for them. And for the Biden administration um, in Washington, it's very difficult to justify not just giving Iran uh, money, but also to uh, delist the IRGC. Uh, but take a moment and look at the alternatives. The alternative uh, is for the Iranians that they would face a political backlash uh, among their own public who's really anxious with anticipation uh, to be unshackled from U.S. sanctions and get some economic reprieve. Uh, and for uh, the U.S. side, so if there is no deal, there will be a popular backlash against uh, the Iranian uh, government. Uh, and in, on the U.S. side, if there is no deal, yes, the administration would not pay an immediate price in terms of delisting the, F, uh, the IRGC. But a few months down the road, when we get closer to midterm elections, uh, the opponents of the agreement would blame President Biden for allowing Iran to become a virtual nuclear weapon state, because at the, at the current rate of Iran's nuclear advancements, uh, in the coming month, in April, uh, Iran's breakout time, which is the amount of time that it takes to enrich enough uranium for a single nuclear weapon, which right now is below two weeks, uh, by the end of April will be a matter of days, uh, would be in the zone that U.S. officials uh, call margin of error, uh, which basically means between two inspections of a site uh, in a matter of four or five days, Iran would be able to enrich enough fissile material for a single nuclear weapon using its 60% um, enrich uranium stockpile, which, as you know, 60% is 99% of, uh, of the work required to reach weapons grade. So Iran is really, uh, you know, this, this, this far away from having weapons grade uranium. And in many ways, even 60% can be used in, uh, in uh, a, a, a dirty bomb, uh, if, if that's the objective. A Hiroshima style nuclear weapon is doable with 60% uh, enrich uranium. So um, uh, you know, the alternative is not really any better for uh, either side. Um, but again, as I said in the beginning, the problem is, uh, you know, despite uh, uh, European efforts and, uh, you know, Enrique Mora uh, has been trying very, very hard. Uh, but um, again, it's very difficult to find a mutually acceptable formula. And this is a situation is, you know, like a Mexican standoff that each side expects the other uh, to concede because they think that the other needs to deal more. Um, the reality is that both sides really need it, but both sides are also, I think, prone to miscalculation. If I could quickly add something uh, to that, it's just, um, you know, for me, this final issue and the absurdity of it, which Ali outlined beautifully, absurdity on both ends, you know, on the Iranian end, the Iranians are not asking for Trump's 
uh, October 2017 designation of the IRGC as a specially designated global terrorist, or you know Iran being on the state sponsor of state sponsors of terror lists to be rescinded or you know removed. So you know obviously they're not trying to change the minds of foreign investors with this FTO designation. And then on the other side, obviously, we know that the Biden administration, if it really wanted it to, if it really wanted to, it could really defend this decision because of the fact that it really doesn't have much material consequence. But I think that it really points to the domestic uh, restraints that both sides are under, the fracturing in domestic politics over doing any deal with the other side. There's this built-in ontological anxiety of doing any kind of deal with the other. And for both sides, I think because, but especially the Iranian side, um, because they were burned so badly by the JCPOA experience, um, you know, getting this over the finish line, they may be doing themselves a disservice by, by giving so much oxygen to this specific issue now at the very end. And, um, you know, they may be underestimating um, the, the level of consequences for continuing to make this an issue um, whilst also advancing their, their nuclear program. And, you know, there is an option for Iran to exercise restraint in that regard, but we are already at a point, as Ali said, where, um, you know, it doesn't really matter uh, so much anymore. It's, it's really at a crucial point. So Ali and Sahil just now, you both mentioned this sort of end of April timeline where that breakout time is just so short that it's a matter of a few days. What happens if there's not a deal by then? Is the general thought on the European side and the American side that you keep pushing this vision of a deal? Or do we hit that benchmark and everything changes? Is it new negotiations? Is it new sorts of controls? What differentiates now and then in terms of the negotiations? So I don't think there will be a moment of collapse uh, if there is no deal uh, by that point. Uh, I think what happens is that, you know, it, it's not a big bang, it's going to be a whimper kind of uh, uh, failed diplomacy uh, in the sense that uh, you would see uh, this pause being uh, becoming protracted. Um, and then eventually uh, the U.S. will start imposing sanctions. Um, you know, it's really easy to predict that the Iranians would retaliate by further escalating their nuclear program, either ratcheting up uh, their nuclear activities or ratcheting down inspections. Um, and, you know, there, there's another critical factor here, which is that now it's almost a year, more than a year, uh, that the IAEA has a, um, an alternative inspection mechanism in place uh, instead of the additional protocol, which provided inspectors with enhanced access and also uh, some of the transparency measures that were built into the JCPOA through having cameras installed uh, at facilities that the inspectors have lost uh, uh, access to. Now, uh, you know, it, it's easy, it's not easy, but it's doable still for the IAEA to put back that picture together by looking through the recordings of these cameras uh, in the past uh, uh, you know, 13, 14 months. Um, but at some point that becomes really impossible. So the IAEA would lost what is known as continuity of knowledge uh, about Iran's nuclear program. Um, and of course, again, Iran's nuclear advancements would render the non-proliferation value of the deal uh, kind of moot. I don't want to say irrelevant because uh, I don't think it will become irrelevant, but nevertheless, you know, right now, if the deal is, is restored, the breakout time is not going to be the 12 months that was originally devised in the deal. It's going to be probably somewhere between six and nine months. Um, but again, uh, a few weeks from now or a few months from now, uh, that would even be shorter. And a lot of people would say it's not worth returning to the original agreement. So we would get into a cycle that we have seen in the past. Uh, it's what I used to call the race of sanctions against centrifuges. Uh, under uh, the Bush administration and the first term of the Obama administration. Uh, it's a lose-lose dynamic for both sides. So eventually they would have to get back to the table. The problem is 
you know, in, 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 in that time, in those uh, um, uh, years, there was a much bigger headspace for escalation on both sides. Now we're kind of already on the verge of uh, stumbling into a potential military confrontation because of how close Iran's nuclear program is to the verge of nuclear weapons. Um, and so uh, you remember uh, um, Prime Minister Netanyahu's red line at the UN in 2012, which was on 240 kilograms of 20% enrichment. Uh, which is the critical quantity for a single nuclear weapon if further enriched to 90%. Um, that critical quantity in 60% terms is uh, 40 kilograms. And Iran, as of last month, was above 30 kilograms, right? So it's not, uh, as I said, it would it's a threshold that would be reached in the next few weeks. Um, it's not a static situation that you can just push the pause button and get back to it after you go through a cycle of escalation, right? So uh, the question is, what could be done? And I think uh, if it becomes clear that this issue is not bridgeable, uh, then the best solution that both sides have is to try to um, get uh, um, a, an interim agreement, a freeze for freeze that would basically see uh, Iran's oil uh, returning to the market, which obviously is a win for the West because it would bring down uh, international uh, energy prices uh, at this moment, uh, given uh, the stresses that uh, the oil and gas markets uh, are facing because of the crisis in Ukraine. Um, and then uh, the US would, uh, uh, and the Iranians would in return commit uh, or freeze uh, some of uh, the more proliferation sensitive activities that they're engaged in, enrichment above 20% or uh, even above 5%, um, or, or maybe advanced centrifuges as well, or restoring access to uh, IAEA. Uh, but in any case, I think there will be room for uh, an interim deal that would then create time and space for negotiating a successor agreement because the JCPOA uh, cl clearly uh, would lose its value uh, for both sides. But again, having said all of this, um, I, I think the risks are pretty significant uh, and we can't really downplay them uh, because uh, you know the same, same people who uh, were very worried when Iran's breakout time was uh, you know, a matter of years, now say uh, that uh, a breakout time of a few days doesn't really matter because that's not a nuclear weapon. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I still can't believe that uh, Israel would be comfortable with Iran being that close uh, to, uh, to the verge of nuclear weapons. So there is a risk of covert operations or even military strikes that the Iranians uh, would uh, retaliate against. Uh, and again, from that point on, it can easily spiral out of control. Yes, absolutely. And I want to get into that regional context. What has been the Israeli response to the negotiation, negotiations as of now? Do they have any thoughts on the um, FTO determination? How do they feel about circling around the deal? I guess that's for Sahel. Um, yeah, I mean, so the Israelis have obviously tried to put up obstacles um, throughout the process and um, you know, it's it's nothing new when it comes to um, the FTO designation. So um, I believe that the Israeli foreign minister said on Sunday that, um, you know, they would continue to cooperate with Washington on preventing a nuclear armed Iran, um, but that they have disagreements over the nuclear deal and, you know, things that are being put forward as part of it. Um, there are also leaks made by Israeli government officials um, a few weeks ago. And as part of that, one of those things that were leaked was indeed um, the fact that the FTO designation was on the table. Um, and it wasn't really in the press until the Israelis um, made noise about it, which goes to show that that is one of the things that they are not um, all that content about. What's interesting though, however, is what's come out since then is you had previously asked, Leia, um, you know, what do the Americans want in response? And essentially what has come out is that the Americans would like in the text some sort of a commitment that the Iranians will exercise restraint, reduce tensions, and 
you know, abide by some level of a truce in the region. Um, and this is very much in line with the preamble of the JCPOA, which says that this is meant to be not only a contribution to nonproliferation, but also to kind of wider regional security and stability, et cetera. Um, and there may be some more operational ideas on the American side as to how one then monitors such restraint or reduction in tensions, et cetera, and what kind of bodies or committees or dialogue fora um, then are created to, to look at that. But um, this is indeed, I think, uh, now going beyond the nuclear for sanctions parameters of the original deal. Um, and interestingly, at the same time, the Iranian foreign minister came out um, over the weekend and said that the IRGC has said, if the FTO designation is one of the only, if that's the only thing that remains in the way of getting this over the finish line, then don't let us stand in the way of, you know, protecting or preserving the national interest through a deal, et cetera. Um, so it's, it's been very interesting to watch the politics play back and forth, um, both between the US and Iran, but also external actors um, like Israel that have really pushed the issue into the public domain. And then Iran hawks sort of seized the moment. And um, you'll have seen congressional officials, experts, et cetera, have really um, pounced on this issue as a way of saying that Biden is making a grave mistake by trying to restore the deal and making um, all these concessions. I mean, you know, once the deal, if and when it is finalized, we can debate the merits of what the concessions are that the Americans have made. Um, but I think that when they see those concessions, the FTO designation will be very low priority compared to the level of sanctions relief that the Americans are offering, for example, especially because Ali said, um, you know, the breakout time will really be within the window of six to nine months as opposed to 12 months. We can debate also breakout, met, you know, breakout time as a metric, whether it has any validity or really if it matters, considering that that's just really one step of the process and um, verification and monitoring indeed still does exist. Um, but I think uh, it, it's going to be it's going to be a very interesting time in Washington if um, this proceeds in the case of an FTO designation being lifted or even in the case of it not being lifted. Um, because again, the, the Americans have had to make concessions because if you think about it, the Iranian economy has been put under great duress um, for years now under the Trump administration and Iran continued to abide by the deal for an entire year in full as certified by the IAEA. And then as they feel was granted to them under the text of the deal, paragraphs 26 and 36, that if um, sanctions were reimposed, that they could in part or in full cease their obligations under the deal. And they did this with a tempo, uh, you know, so that their actions would be predictable and leaving what they felt was time and breathing room for diplomacy in between each of those things, uh, each of those moves um, away. And also, in addition to that, we had alleged Israeli sabotage of Iranian nuclear facilities, which really pushed things over the edge and um, emboldened hardliners in the Iranian parliament to force former President Rouhani's hand in really sticking to those nuclear advancements um, and, and really enshrining it into law. So um, yeah, in terms of the Israeli role, um, they have been acting as a spoiler, um, and they continue to act as a spoiler, in my opinion. And um, it's obviously a great shame because Israel has nuclear weapons. Um, you know, it's the great open secret of nuclear politics, um, but also because there is great promise for better regional security. I think the past few years has been a huge wake up call. Um, to many in the region. And if you look at how Gulf states have been reacting to the restoration of the JCPOA versus when it originally was conceived, I think they have a pretty good understanding that if you get the JCPOA back on track and you are able to put the nuclear issue on the back burner, then you can really take advantage of the appetite for more economic interdependence in the region, 
more risk reduction in terms of security affairs um, and, and other issues. I mean, there are so many issues that are affecting the Middle East, even outside of those files, um, especially when it comes to resource management, climate change, et cetera. So really the moment is now, I think, for everyone to look at this deal a bit more objectively and to really think hard about what the consequences of a world without um, any kind of nuclear agreement would look like. Thank you. I want to take some time and answer some questions that have been sent in for the audience. Uh, please feel free to use the Q&A function to send any questions you may want to have answered. The first question is the idea that Iran is only months, weeks, or days away from producing enough fissile material for a nuclear weapon is something that the U.S. has used as an impetus for negotiations for decades. What makes this time different or more urgent? Yeah, so that's a good question. And uh, Sahil already uh, answered it, I think, to a certain extent that it, you know, breakout time is an artificial concept. Um, you can have a theoretical uh, calculation of how long it would take given the country's capabilities to uh, enrich enough material for a single weapon, but that is in case that uh, there is no breakdown in the process or everything goes according to a computer model, but in the real world, things often don't work that way, right? Like, especially with 60% enrichment, uh, there's always uh, a, a, a risk of uh, reaching uh, criticality and things can heat up and break down in the enrichment process. So uh, again, this is uh, just a, a yardstick that was used uh, in order to create sufficient distance uh, between Iran's civilian and military uh, nuclear uh, capabilities. Uh, it's not a God-given rule uh, that, you know, you can really count on. And again, uh, the fact that uh, it was decided on 12 months uh, and not 10 or 13 or 15 was also completely arbitrary. Uh, the idea was that you would have enough uh, time in case uh, there is an attempt to uh, break out uh, to, to, to stop Iran from moving in that direction uh, using non-military means, uh, so sanctions or mobilizing international community to, to tr try to stop Iran. But, you know, whether we like it or not, uh, it is a metric that has been used for many years uh, and is still going to be a huge part of political debate. Again, uh, I think those who uh, oppose the JCPOA, oppose the JCPOA from the beginning, uh, promised that they would uh, basically put uh, together a better agreement uh, using maximum pressure and really failed to better the agreement, are now downplaying the importance of the same issue that they used to criticize the JCPOA. Uh, I mean, I remember uh, people like uh, Senator Menendez used to say uh, the, pr the biggest issue with JCPOA sunsets is that Iran's breakout time uh, in you know post-2031 uh, will be a matter of weeks. Well, the only effect of withdrawing from the JCPOA is that the breakout is now a matter of days uh, as a result of uh, unleashing Iran's nuclear program, right? So I think it's, it's again, it's a concept that has been misused uh, by both sides uh, of this debate. Um, and, uh, but again, it's also not going to disappear overnight because it's artificial or because it's been uh, used in a biased uh, um, uh, manner. Um, but look, the reality is, I think, uh, to go back to your question on Israel, of course, it was a joint statement by Israeli prime minister and foreign minister uh, that they were, would be shocked if the FDO designation is removed, is that I think at the end of the day for a lot of uh, critics of the JCPOA. Uh, the problem they have is not with uranium enrichment, it's with Iranian enrichment. You know, they are worried that uh, uh, sanctions relief would provide Iran with resources that it would better uh, be able to better project power uh, in the region. And so if that is the case, uh, then no nuclear deal would be satisfactory to them, right? Because there is no real world agreement in which Iran would reap no financial benefits and would agree to put its nuclear program in a box. So I think that's why it's important for the Biden administration to decide what is more important to them, uh, making sure that Iran's 
nuclear program is put back in a box and under rigorous monitoring, or that the superfluous sanction that has no impact whatsoever in the real world uh, remains on, on the books. That's, that's really the question. It really boils down to that. And the rest of these arguments uh, that, that we're having right now at breakout time or, or other issues, I think, are just noise, to be very honest with you. Thank you. And on the sanctions piece, we do have another question. Um, I think the Wall Street Journal recently reported on Iran setting up a secret operation to overcome sanctions. What are your thoughts on this weakening the leverage the West has on Iran? Yeah, I don't mind um, taking a first stab at that. I mean, there's always been a secret operation <laughs> to weather sanctions in Iran. Iran has found very effective ways in the past of of being able to create channels and uh, conduct illicit trade, um, illicit, of course, ones that are sanctions busting or uh, circumvent sanctions. Um, but at the end of the day, um, and although Iran's economy has indeed returned um, from, you know, a recession to at least zero growth or very, you know, at least it's returning to a growth pattern. Um, the sanctions create a huge economic toll on the country and the level of inflation, the, you know, the loss of jobs, et cetera, these are uh, issues that affect the entire population. And there are also negative externalities of those sanctions, even in terms of humanitarian access. So medicine, um, PPE, other things that were very vital to Iran's um, COVID response. You know, so these effects of sanctions are felt on the ground. Um, although Iran can find ways to try to circumvent uh, sanctions, I think that's become a lot more difficult in recent years. Um, and I think there's a general awareness that um, as much as Iran can try to find ways to create um, outlets for trade, um, at the end of the day, it's it's not never going to be the same whilst these U.S. secondary sanctions remain in place. And of course, there will still be other sanctions that remain in place, um, including U.S. primary sanctions. But those secondary sanctions really inhibit um, Iran's economy in a way that um, I think is understood by the entire political spectrum. And I think that's why the Raisi administration came in um, making the very clear judgment that they would continue the negotiations, although in their own way and with their own demands. Um, but that's because they know that sanctions relief really is needed to unlock um, the full potential of what their administration can try to achieve um, economically, especially. Ali, do you want to hop on to that or shall we move to the next question? No, I think that was a perfect answer. Okay, wonderful. Glad to hear it. Um, and then we have a question. Given the rockiness of Western ties with Russia at the moment, would that not make trying to go for a freeze for freeze, as you mentioned previously, Ali, followed by negotiations on a follow-on deal, even more of an uphill climb? A way in favor for the Biden administration of unpleasant compromise now to restore the JCPOA? instead? Uh, of course, Laura will always ask good questions. Um, look, uh, the reality is uh, a freeze for freeze would be an Iran-US agreement, not an Iran P5 plus one agreement. Um, and um, in that scenario, I think Russian, uh, uh, the tensions with Russia are not going to have a significant impact on both sides' ability to negotiate an interim agreement. I think there are bigger political risks uh, to negotiating a deal uh, in Tehran and Washington uh, in terms of an interim agreement. Uh, in Washington, there are people who believe a, an interim agreement will become permanent and basically uh, the Biden administration would provide Iran with a lifeline in return for something that is much, uh, it's shorter and weaker instead of being a longer and stronger deal, right? So uh, there, there would be a lot of criticism uh, in, in Washington as well. In Tehran, the idea is that Iran would give away most of its uh, assets that it's using for accumulating leverage and strengthening its hand away 
for something that is much less than uh, even the sanctions relief that uh, was uh, uh, on the offer within the JCPOA, which in their view was already unsatisfactory. So for those reasons, I think the idea of an interim deal is not really that attractive uh, to either side. But again, the question is, how does it compare to alternatives? And the alternative is, you know, Iran's nuclear program would grow exponentially by the day and the U.S. would have to switch to sanctions and the Europeans would have to snap back the U.N. sanctions. And now with the P5 unity completely shattered, uh, I don't know how the Iranians would be able to get out from under U.N. Uh, Charter Chapter 7 sanctions uh, if, uh, you know, uh, Russia and China and, and the West uh, are, are remain at uh, daggers drawn in the, in the same way that they are right now. And there is no prospect of significant de-escalation in great power competition. So um, that's why, uh, you know, I, I think uh, there is a real risk in that an interim agreement would become permanent, um, would not result in uh, an immediate follow-on deal. But again, uh, compared to alternatives, I still think it is uh, is better. But, you know, if the JCPOA falls apart, and uh, I would say if eventually in this cycle of escalation, uh, the Europeans who can, uh, you know, uh, legally speaking, have the right to snap back the UN sanctions under the Trump, uh, unlike the Trump administration who tried and failed in 2020, um, if they snap back the UN sanctions, it's the end of the JCPOA. And I would argue it would be the end of the P5 plus one, uh, because uh, unfortunately, the Ukraine crisis has clearly demonstrated uh, that the great powers have lost uh, the, the ability to segregate uh, an area of common interest from the broader context of enmity and rivalry. Um, and so that renders resolving the nuclear issue with, with Iran much more difficult in the coming years. Uh, and maybe potentially in the future, there would be a uh, bilateral uh, Iran-US agreement, because honestly, those are the two main stakeholders. Um, and I, uh, it pains me to say it, and especially with uh, Sahel representing ELN uh, on, on this uh, call today, um, you, you know, the Europeans uh, did a lot politically to try to save the JCPOA, but on the economic side, uh, they really failed to deliver. So in the eyes of the Iranians, uh, what really matters is what the US does. And of course, what the US wants uh, in terms of nuclear restrictions is what the Iranians, uh, is in the power of Iranians to deliver. So I think if, if this whole process falls apart, uh, eventually what could potentially work is uh, a bilateral Iran-US agreement but I think that would be a few years down the line, and it has to go through a very dangerous, perilous nuclear standoff before we get to that kind of agreement. If I could just add to that is, you know, at the moment, we have clearly shifted from an era of trying to maintain um, or enable or reinforce strategic stability to an era of managing strategic instability. And when the US and Russia and when NATO and Russia are in the middle of a conflict, um, you know, and when they are trying to figure out ways to get through um, what is clearly a crisis that is affecting all governments involved in a way that reduces bandwidth to really think about anything else other than what's happening in Ukraine, um, the ability to protect diplomatic space, even on an issue that the US and Russia both agree and that Europeans all agree um, is an issue that's vital to security on the European continent, to the United States, to you know across the world, um, no matter um, how important the Iranian nuclear issue has been especially over the past um, past few years, when that diplomatic space doesn't exist, um, it's very difficult to see how we would be able to, if, if the JCPOA falls apart at this point and an interim deal is put in place, like Ali said, how we would get then back to diplomacy on a wider, more robust and fully fledged agreement. Um, so 
But yeah, I would say that the wider context really does play a role. I mean, of course, a lot of the focus in recent days has been over the Russian asks on you know, civil nuclear cooperation and also wider trade and investment that Russia would want to make under the JCPOA. Um, but uh, in reality, it's, 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 it's a much bigger problem because let's not forget that in addition to the JCPOA, the Biden administration and Europeans and others have all had an eye on a stronger and longer deal with Iran or a better deal with Iran, which I think that we all would hope would continue to include the P5 plus one as a grouping, because um, it is true that Russia and China have, as it was true during the original JCPOA negotiations, played a really substantial role. Um, you know, there have been many points in time in which the Iranians were wanting to walk away from the table in Vienna over the past however many months, now almost a year. Um, but the Russians quickly swooped in and went and did a lot of late night shuttle diplomacy with the E3 and with the US. Um, and also they've offered great technical expertise, especially when it comes to Iran's nuclear program and um, figuring out how to uh, restrain the capabilities and stockpiles because Russia has had a really historic, uh, robust relationship with Iran, specifically on civil nuclear cooperation. So the Russian role is very important. It's not vital to the tenets of what would make up probably an interim agreement. But one detail that I will share, which is interesting, is that when an interim agreement has come up, even within the past two to three months, um, the Russians were still involved in that conversation. And that is because they are a very important channel in between the US um, and, and Iran. So, um, you know, I, I think that that uh, should hopefully give some level of insight into why I think the West really should, if at all possible, on this specific issue, try to preserve that diplomatic space. Very insight insightful. Thank you. On the idea of preserving this diplomacy, we have a great question. Is there a feasible and peaceful way on the part of Iran to make it harder for the next US administration to leave the deal? Um, so, first of all, there's no not peaceful way uh, in which this could be achieved. Uh, but um, uh, I would also argue that there is no way within the framework of the JCPOA uh, to achieve this objective, because as the name suggests, the Joint Plan of Action, uh, this is a political understanding, it's not even an agreement. Uh, and uh, even if it was uh, an official agreement and a treaty, uh, unfortunately, in the U.S. system, uh, and this is really bizarre as a democracy, uh, that uh, you know, U.S. commitments, international commitments, depend on the whim of a single individual. Um, uh, it's very difficult to get into treaties because you need two thirds of the Senate, well, representing democratic will of U.S. people. But uh, any single individual as president on his own with a strike of a pen basically can get out of any agreement. And that's really puzzling to a lot of international actors. But, you know, this is the U.S. legal and political system. Um, so what is doable, not again in the framework of the JCPOA, but in the framework of a successor agreement, uh, is to build uh, two specific measures that would make a future agreement a bit more sustainable. First is uh, basically making it logistically harder to withdraw. Uh, so for instance, uh, you know, when the US wanted to uh, withdraw from the Paris climate deal or from WHO, there was a need for an advance notice uh, of a year or in some cases two years before that action would take effect. Uh, the MPT, for instance, you have to provide a 90-day advance notice before you can withdraw. Uh, in the JCPOA, there was no exit clause, no requirement, no justification needed, no advance notice. Um, and uh, of course, other mechanisms related to um, uh, snapback of the UN sanctions 
all have been designed in a way that is uh, quite vulnerable uh, to misuse and exploitation. So you can basically make withdrawing from the agreement just from a procedural per perspective harder by creating a, an exit clause which has a bunch of stringent requirements and timelines. Um, number two is to create costs uh, for the next U.S. administration, and that is by making it basically uh, legally susceptible to lawsuits uh, for companies that would suffer as a result of an unwarranted U.S. withdrawal. So if Total, for instance, has an investment in Iran and without the Joint Commission's approval, the U.S. or any other country for that matter, decide to withdraw and uh, Total or, you know, whatever company, Samsung or, you know, uh, an Asian company uh, suffers uh, uh, as a result of that, uh, that it could go to international courts and uh, demand compensation. Uh, that would make uh, any uh, U.S. administration or any other government think twice out of fear that it would get in, entangled in lengthy and potentially costly uh, legal disputes, uh, uh, which, you know, again, uh, the JCPOA currently uh, does not provide that opportunity. So there are ways uh, to address this shortcoming uh, in the deal. Um, but again, it only comes in a follow on successor agreement and not in the JCPOA. If I could add to that, um, you know, those are two extremely great ideas. Um, you know, one thing that we've been thinking about very much at the ELN has been in the absence of any legal guarantees being possible, because Biden cannot bind any future US presidents to his views on the importance or value of the JCPOA, and also insufficient political guarantees, because even if Biden is to say that he will not leave the deal um, so long as Iran is compliant, um, again, that doesn't make any difference for future administrations, that the real area to look at is the technical, is the economic, um, and trying to figure out, like Ali has outlined, uh, one you know, great example of an idea, um, how you can create a situation in which all these countries have more skin in the game to ensure that the deal is indeed a win-win deal. So in the same way that you have countries stepping in to help with the civil nuclear cooperation that helps get Iran's nuclear program um, under caps, but also geared towards producing um, the necessary things that Iran wants out of its nuclear program, how do you do that with economic projects? Um, you know, what is the level of well, what are the relationships between the public and private sectors in terms of engendering um, collaboration in that regard? Because of course, Iran wasn't happy with the level of trade and investment that the sanctions relief under the Obama administration provided as well. So there is room there for improvement. Um, and again, I don't think that under the current negotiations much is going to be offered by the US or Europeans other than a large tranche of sanctions relief. Um, but there are ideas like the one that Ali said that could be useful perhaps in a future negotiation on that stronger, longer, better um, deal that everyone is, is looking towards. Of course, some of those ideas have indeed come up during the negotiations, but um, all of them have had pros and cons to them and really, at the end of the day, I think the U.S. administration is in a position where, of course, they will be willing to lift sanctions, um, but I don't think that they're necessarily in a place where they are able to look at the situation and um, be happy enough with what they're receiving that they are willing to um, give too much assurances. And I think Iran should really just uh, take what they're getting at, at, the, at the moment. And every day that passes, they're losing an opportunity to really um, create some more resilience within their economy. Because if we are in a place where a 
Trump or Trump variant returns to the Oval Office um, in just what two two years from now, uh, three years from now, um, then at least they will have used this time to help um, in case they are faced again with another era of maximum pressure. And if anything, like Ali said, um, this experience should show them that no matter how important the European community feels that uh, the JCPOA is, without the US participating, it's really impossible for um, the West and Iran to have any sort of economic uh, uh, you know, relations. And also that China and Russia, there are limitations to the level of trade and investment that they are able to carry as well. Um, you know, although China is able to purchase a large amount of Iranian oil, if you look at the amount of trade that Russia does with Iran, um, it's it's really not enough, I think, uh, to merit this p- potential shift to the east that many are saying that Iran wants um, or, or or is going for. Um, and I think Iran knows that. I think that they know that really they need to engage both the West and the East um, to, to have a, a strong economy. Thank you. I want to wrap this up. Um, those were fantastic answers. This has been a fantastic conversation. I want to ask each, each of you, what are you looking for in the coming week or two? And what should all of us be looking for? Well, I, I'll be looking to see if uh, the negotiators book a ticket to Vienna, uh, because uh, you know that's. Uh, I think if they go back, it's because it's a sign that the biggest obstacle uh, that we discuss has been removed, uh, and uh, you know it would take probably not more than a day or two to finalize uh, the, the remaining details of the deal and you know dot the i's and cross the t's and and announce an agreement. Uh, then the implementation process is going to be uh, difficult uh, because, again, there's a lot of mistrust on both sides and uh, there will be a backlash to, to this agreement, which most likely has to go through a congressional review process. Uh, it's a trial by fire, of course, uh, uh, not maybe as difficult as in 2015, but nevertheless, it's going to be uh, costly uh, to, to both sides. Um, and I think, uh, you know, after uh, the dust settles, uh, the biggest question would be whether the parties would have the ability to negotiate that follow on agreement that we discussed and also uh, tackle the broader context uh, of uh, enmity between Iran and the U.S. and their respective allies in, in the region. Uh, that was at uh, blame for destabilizing the JCPOA in the first place. And that requires regional diplomacy, that requires inclusive regional diplomacy between Iran and its neighbors, especially in the Persian Gulf region, uh, that now seems to be much more appetite for uh, compared to 2015. Uh, but it really, uh, uh, it, what is necessary is political will on the side of Iran and its neighbors to find Uh, win-win solutions uh, to de-escalate tensions in the region as well, and for great powers to be supportive of that. Uh, I don't think anyone would benefit in the middle of this Ukraine crisis to also have uh, more fires burning uh, around the Middle East. Um, So that's what, uh, you know, would be an ideal scenario in the coming uh, weeks and months. Uh, But uh, again, I don't want to hold my breath because unfortunately, Um, both sides are prone to uh, miscalculation uh, and we have seen a lot of opportunities like that being squandered in the past as well. But fingers crossed that uh, my pessimism is misplaced. Thank you. Sahil. I couldn't agree more. Um, You know, I will be looking out for the exact same things. I think um, that Enrique Mora's time in Washington at the moment is vital because he will be carrying messages from Tehran on this very specific issue. And, you know, as I said, over the weekend, it was clear, at least from the foreign minister's point of view, that perhaps this may be an issue that doesn't deserve as much oxygen as it has been getting. And that if at the end of the day, it is one that the US doesn't show an ability to move on, that maybe it isn't the best thing to put the whole deal at risk. 
Um, but of course, we know that there are many different power centers in Iran and that, um, you know, we'll just have to wait and see uh, how the criticism he received for, I think, making those comments publicly may have then actually further entrenched the IRGC's desire to have that designation removed. So I would like to see the outcomes of Enrique Mora's visit to Washington. Um, but realistically, at the end of the day, like Ali said, the most important thing is if everybody books plane tickets to go back to Vienna to resume this eighth round and hopefully finally final round of negotiations, because for example, the E3 made it very clear. They said, our work here is done. Um, and that's why we left Vienna because, you know, all the issues that were meant to be resolved um, were realistically resolved. And I don't see them necessarily, I don't see them returning to Vienna unless this bilateral issue um, is taken care of. So if that becomes the case, then, and we move into a period in which we have everybody engaging, then we'll also be looking at whether or not the environment will be conducive for perhaps direct US-Iran talks. I think it's much further down the line in terms of, I think both sides will need to make moves to re-implement their sides of the bargain before that maybe becomes possible, especially because the US is technically not part of the joint commission at the moment. But I think it will be in Iran's favor to, to um, retreat a bit from their stance that talks with the US come with such a large price tag because that direct interaction may actually be really useful for sanctions lifting and relief to be more effective on the ground. So I'll be looking out for that. And just lastly, I think um, what will be interesting will be to see how the domestic moods in both countries look like even this time next week. Um, because if we are in a position where we begin to see the re-implementation of this deal unfolding, it will be a rocky process because there are people in not just the US and Iran, but also in Europe, for example, who do not want to see this succeed. Um, so seeing the tug of war um, between the different viewpoints um, will generate a lot of attention uh, towards this issue. And I think even sufficient attention to begin competing with um, the large amount of attention that's obviously being given to Russia's invasion of, of Ukraine and the ensuing war there. Um, so uh, it is going to be a battle to defend the outcome, but I think that um, it'll be good for there to be it would be it would have been great if there could have been a healthy debate. Um, but of course, any debate on Iran in Washington is inherently toxic and not very objective. So um, you know, we'll be looking out for early signs that that is on its way. And I actually think those signs have already begun to surface. Well, well, thank you both. We will certainly keep our eyes on diplomatic arrivals in Vienna. Um, but thank you to the two of you for joining us. Thank you to the audience for joining us in this discussion. It has been wonderful, enlightening. Really appreciate you taking the time. Um, a recording of this will be posted on the IST website and on YouTube. Thank you so much, Sahil and Ali, for joining me. And good afternoon, good morning. Have a nice evening, everyone. Bye. Thank you.